Uh, so my name is Daniel, and thank you for coming to, to my talk. Uh, sorry for the, for the delay. Uh, so we're going to talk about category theory in some way or another, and, and we'll, we'll see how we can use category theory as a sort of a tool to help us think about, about programs. Uh, before we begin, I, I'd like to start with a small introduction. So if you, if you happen to follow the functional world, and especially Haskell world, you might have heard of someone uh, named uh, Edward Kmet. And I'll use him as an example of someone that, that is very proficient with category theory and, and is kind of the inspiration for, for, this, uh, for this specific talk. Uh, so this is a somewhat edited quote from the Haskell Reddit, where someone is describing some cool new idea that they just discovered and want to share with the, with the world. And Edward Kmet uh, comments that this is just the right kind of extension of something something. And when seeing such a quote, uh, s s s such a reference, I'm, first thing I wonder is whether there is like a left kind of extension and what, what would that do? Would it, would it be just as interesting as the right kind of extension? Uh, but delving d more deeply, there's something very profound here. Uh, so so we, what we see here is an example of someone using category theory to derive one idea from another. So this is uh, as an example of, of something that, uh, how you can use category theory to explo explore what I'll call the idea space. Uh, so what do I mean by, uh, by the idea space? So there are many useful ideas uh, in, this, in this world, and every once in a while someone will discover a useful idea. <coughs> And if we're lucky, uh, we might discover some other smaller ideas that are kind of related to the... Oh, sorry, my I'm, I'm seeking two clickers, like here and here, so... Uh, it's like a coordination test. So, so uh, we might discover some, some other ideas as well, kind of related to the, to the, to, to the major one. Maybe not as, as major as the, the original idea, but still nice to have, like something that we, we just discovered. And somewhere else, someone might discover another idea with, with its own follow-up ideas that, uh, that, they are, uh, that, that they can discover as well. Uh, and then you, you, this process kind of repeats itself through history. People discover many, uh, many different ideas and many different concepts. Uh, and and once uh, and so, but uh, and this is what I, I'll call the idea. Sp Oops, my mind. What? Where's the? Ah, here. So this is what I'll call the uh, the idea space. Kind of the, all the ideas that we discover. And the problem is here that that uh, all, all the ideas here, the major ideas we just discovered, they're kind of the disconnected. So you discard one idea, but you don't have any any tools to kind of move between the different ideas. You might get lucky. You might have a stroke of genius and discover one idea, but the same stroke of genius will not necessarily help you discover something else that, that is out there in the idea space. And so uh, what, what I'm trying to say here is that we're lacking tools to explore the idea space in a way that, that's more systematic and mechanical than just waiting for a eureka moment and trying to kind of come up with something new. So in this talk, uh, what I'm going to try and show you is, is that category theory, theory can pr provide us with the tools to help us explore and connect various concepts in, in the idea space. So using techniques from category theory, uh, we'll be able to connect different shapes uh, in the idea space. And sometimes they might even help us uh, discover uh, brand, oops, brand new ideas, uh, uh, which might, might even not been obvious without the tools from category theory. So here's what I'm going to talk about. So, so it's a brief, very brief introduction about what is category theory, just the basic definitions. Uh, then we'll try to see how we can translate ideas from programming into the language of category theory, what this new perspective will help us see and discover. Uh, next, we'll, f we'll see how recognizing the structure of a category within, uh, within some, some, uh, uh, some code or some, some idea can help us, uh, can lead us to new insights. And, uh, and, and the last class of techniques that we'll use uh, uh, is, is how we can move ideas between categories, which is a very powerful way to kind of discover new things. Uh, and we'll wrap up with something like a, a case study, uh, which will kind of demonstrate the various ideas uh, uh, that we explore. So hopefully by the end of this talk, uh, you'll be inspired to approach category theory on your own and kind of explore and use it as a tool for thought. So let's uh, start. <coughs> so I'm going to introduce you to the very basics of category theory. Uh, uh, I'm warning that I'm not a mathematician. This is not as rigorous as some mathematically inclined people wi might want. Uh, I'm sorry for that, but... It's a programming conference, so I'm allowed. 
Uh, okay, so the most basic uh, uh, so the most basic thing in category theory is that we have uh, a number. Uh, we, we have two two things that are important important to a category. We have something called the object, so a bunch of objects which we'll just label with uh, with different. Uh, um, oops, sorry, it's not my clicker as well, so I get confused by the buttons. Um, <coughs> so so we will label different objects, uh, which I'm not specifying what they are yet, and we also have something called morphisms, which are arrows that that go between uh, between the various objects. So so each uh, each uh, arrow here is a morphism, and those morphisms must behave nicely. It's more specifically, they should compose uh, in a in a reasonable way. So for every pair of morphisms that we have one going uh, going in some path, we should have the composition uh, as well, which does the same thing. So going uh, sorry, going for, uh, through f and g is the same as going directly with the composition. Um, <coughs> so, uh, so this is all very, very abstract, uh, and and it can be pretty much anything. That's the point of category theory that you can describe many, many things within this framework. But since this is a programming conference, uh, the category we'll start with is the category formed by the types in the type system that we are uh, using. So. Namely, the objects are going to be the, the, the specific types that we have. So int and string and boolean, any, any concrete type is an example of an object in our category. And, <coughs> and the morphisms are going to be functions. So for example, uh, the, the, uh, the less than five uh, function, uh, function is something for, that goes from the object int to the object boolean. And this is uh, a valid morphism in, in our category. And co function composition, just the regular composition that you, you know, probably know and maybe love, uh, is the composition for, uh, that satisfies our category theor theoretical definition. <coughs> so, uh, so, so with the definitions we have so far, it's pretty much all we're going to need for, for this talk. Uh, wh what is category theory about? So, uh, so first thing is that uh, from uh, we didn't have much in the structure of category uh, other than composition. So it is about composition, uh, and as programmers, this should be very interesting for us because things that compose are usually the nicest things to work with. If you're into functional programming, you're especially familiar with how composition uh, is a nice thing to have. But generally, in programming, it's, it's just a nice uh, uh, a nice property to have on any component that you, you're working with. Uh, but more importantly for, for this talk, uh, category theory is about relationships. So if you notice in the definition of, of objects, I didn't specify anything about the objects themselves. I, uh, themselves. I didn't say what they contain and what is the structure. All, all I care about are the arrows that go in and, in and out of the objects. So basically the only thing that defines, really defines an object is how it relates to other things. And thinking about how things relate uh, to each other is exactly the sort of thing that we need to start exploring the idea space. And that's what we'll be doing next. Okay, so now that we know, know the, the, the very basics of category theory, don't go to a math class and say that you know category theory. They'll probably, I don't know, something bad will happen. Uh, but we, uh, let's uh, we, we, let's try to actually do something useful with it, or useful and within this uh, this uh, talk. So we'll try to take some programming concept and convert it into the language of category theory. That is, we're going to try and convert something that we know for programming into the language of objects and morphisms. And what's, uh, once we do that, we'll see how uh, w w what's the benefit of actually doing that. So, so we start with tuples. Tuples are very simple, simple construct and programming. We probably all use them at some point or another. So it's just a pair of two types. Uh, so this is how mathematicians denote a tuple. They call it a product type, and they have a little x uh, symbol. So we say that this is a product of A and B. Uh, since this is category theory, as I mentioned before, is about relationships, so the first question to ask is, how does the tuple of two types relate to anything else? And the answer is that, oops, uh, the answer is, is that uh, if we have a, a, a pair of types, we, uh, we should probably have a way to extract an A and a B from them. So if I have a, a tuple of A and B, A is somewhere in there and B is somewhere in there. So, uh, so we uh, use, uh, uh, we add two morphisms to our diagram that uh, called projections that will allow us to extract an A and a B value from, uh, from the tuple. Uh, so there are lots of things that can be decomposed into A and B, and we, we want to find the kind of the one that is really fits the definition of a tuple. So if I have a triple, that's obviously not a tuple. So I want to find the kind of the best, the best fit for, 
uh, uh, for being a tuple. So for this purpose, so imagine you do, do have another tuple candidate, someone who pretends to be a tuple. And it, it, it has also uh, uh, projections going for, to A and B, but imagine that this is not a tuple, but say a triple or, or whatever, something that has an extra structure that our tuple should, shouldn't have. So what we want to find is, is kind of how, how do we separate the candidate from the actual tuple. We want to find the best fit, the one that's exactly a tuple and nothing else. Uh, so, so we want a, 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 a categorical construction that is not too big and not too small, something that's exactly the size of a tuple. So one way to, to define it is to do something called a, a universal construction. So uh, this is called the universal arrow, the dashed one. Uh, and the meaning of this arrow is that there's exactly one way uh, uh, to write this arrow down. And what we have here is an example of a commutative diagram. So the idea is that uh, whatever path you choose from one point to another, what, whatever path you choose, the result should be the same. So going directly from C to A is the same as going through from C uh, to a, 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 the product of A and B and then going uh, to A. And the fact that this, uh, this morphism is universal means that there is exactly one way to do this. Uh, and this, this actually uh, kind of chooses the, the, the exactly correct uh, definition of, of a tuple. So, uh, so, so, so if the product was too big, for example, if, if this, this, uh, this tuple wasn't exactly the right fit, then we have more than one way to go from C to the tuple, but uh, we're, we're specifying that we have exactly one way, and if it was too small, there might be no ways to go from, from C to the tuple and then uh, to the right uh, part of the, of the projection. So, uh, so what we did is, is we, we defined the tuple by s solely by the, the, the relationship of tuples to any other thing. And so this, this uh, you, you, it might take some time to develop notation, but this actually captures the idea of a tuple quite precisely. But the question is, uh, so I did a very roundabout way of defining a tuple. I could have just written a case class or something and be, be done with it. And the question is, what, what's the purpose of, of, of defining tuples by their relationships in this way? And one benefit is that re relationships can be reversed. Like quite literally, I can just take the arrows and reverse them, all of them and get something new. And so this, uh, by doing this completely mechanical kind of thing, I discovered uh, a new concept. Uh, this is yet another commutative diagram, so all the arrows must, uh, must match, uh, match the destinations uh, in the same way as before. Uh, and the question is, what, what is this new thing that we discovered? So it's something that you can put an A and uh, take an A and put into it, or you can put, uh, take a B and put in, uh, into it, and it's the best thing that can be that. So it's either an A or a B. That's precisely the either type. Uh, so, uh, or in mathematics, it's called the sum types, hence the plus sign. Uh, so this is quite amazing because with almost zero effort, so we just wrote the diagram for one concept, we flipped the arrows and got something new, completely new that m might not be obviously related uh, to the original thing we started with. And uh, what, we, uh, what we did here is, uh, uh, is part of a general principle called duality. So, so basically you can pretty much uh, uh, generate ideas for free. So, so duality gives us, uh, once you formulate one concept using category theory, you can apply duality to that concept and generate a new idea. Uh, uh, and this is completely mechanical. Unlike, you know, you have to uh, have like a, a eureka moment to discover either. Now you just flip some arrows, you got a new idea. So that, that's the, that makes it much more systematic way to explore things. Uh, and some, sometimes the dual concepts are, are quite, quite different, so not obviously related. So either and tuple are kind of related in our minds because they seem to be similar to kind of thing, but, but there are more non-obviously related things that can be uh, taken from duality. And we get this for free just by taking the categorical, categorical perspective. So from now on, pretty much everything I'm going to tell you is going to, every concept I show you is actually going to be two concepts because, because you can apply, apply duality and get the other concept for free. And I won't be actually be mentioning most of them. So this is the first tool that we're going to use to, to explore the idea space. Uh, but let's, let's delve a little more deeply into, into universal constructions. <coughs> so if, if you do go down the path of some reason of defining things categorically, uh, universal constructions like the one we just saw are something that crop, crop up quite often. Uh, so we just saw the, the product construction, which is, which is the diagram from before, but there are, there are many more. Um, it's very confusing that I'm not seeing the same thing here and here. Uh, sorry. So, so th these are examples of, of various... Uh, okay. My bad. Uh, so these are examples of various uh, universal constructions. Uh, this is the, the, the product type. These other things are something else. You can try and figure out what, what they actually mean in, 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 in some programming language or another. 
but I won't be d diving more deeply into what all of them, uh, all, all of those diagrams actually mean. But I if you actually look at this, there's a kind of a repetitive pattern here. So we have some some kind of uh, of, of pattern, and with something that's pointing into that pattern, and there's like this best thing that is is, is pointing into the pattern, and there's like a universal arrow pointing on on top of all all of those things. And this this is kind of repetitive. And as a programmer, that that really itches uh, kind of. I, I see repetition. I feel like like it's code that wasn't dried enough or something. And, and luckily, mathematicians are very, very good at, at uh, distilling patterns and kind of taking out the essence of something and, and putting it into, into a, a separate concept. And uh, so we can use their knowledge to see what, uh, what, what is the actual pattern. So what do we have here? So, so we start out with some category where we want to, to take out the pattern. So, so we, we want, we want out in this category, we want to select some parts of them to describe a pattern. So we'll use another category just for, uh, for this pattern. So we'll call this the indexing category. And you don't really have to remember the names, but it'll be uh, diagrammatic enough. And hopefully, it's, uh, it's explainable. So in this case, we want to uh, uh, single out two, two uh, objects within our our uh, target category, so we do exactly that. So, uh, so we do a mapping between our indexing category into the into the category we actually want to work with. And this, in this case, we're singling out two uh, two objects within our category. Uh, uh, and formally speaking, we're building a functor between two categories, but I won't be actually delving into any of that. Uh, so we call this construction a diagram. So, so it's a, a, a diagram of the indexing category within our uh, actual category. Imagine that those are types, for example, string and boolean and the like. So we're indexing, uh, uh, indexing one uh, from one category into the other. And so this covers the, the, the idea that we need to select a pattern within our category. Next, uh, we want to have the universal construction. So. Uh, so, uh, so we'll just focus on on the pattern that we singled out. So we chose two objects within within our category, and want to uh, uh, and what we <coughs> sorry. Uh, uh, so now we want to kind of find the best the best way to describe this pattern, like the, mi the most minimal and precise way of ca capturing the idea that I have two things uh, within my category. So uh, for this, we're, we're going to uh, uh, um, th so the I cannot, I'm seeing the diagram here and not here. Sorry. So for this purpose, we're going to, we're going to select some object that points into, into our category. So, so uh, in all the diagrams we had before, so our, our uh, idea of a tuple should have been pointing into two, two separate directions. And we want this to be the best one. Uh, so, so this construction, we call it a cone. So it looks like kind of a cone. It points into, uh, into our diagram. Uh, and so, so this is called a cone over, over the diagram. And what we want to choose is the best cone, kind of the one that, that's the, the most precisely describing this property of having two projections. So, so we uh, suppose we have multiple candidates for the various cones, uh, and we want to say that this one is the best one to be to be our cone over our diagram, and uh, and so for this purpose we will choose. Uh, we'll make a universal a universal arrow, a single one, which it says that whatever co other cone you're choosing, this one is the best one because you can move to it and then do whatever you were trying to do. So this is very similar to the thing we did before. Uh, 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 but in this case, we we just rewritten uh, sorry rewritten the, the the same the same diagram we had before using something weird with cones and limits and whatever. So this is called a limit. Okay, this this uh, cone over this diagram called the limit. And it's not to be confused with limits from like uh, high school or something, uh, but quite some somewhat similar. Um, so having described the, 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 the product in this very roundabout weird way with indexing categories and cones and limits and diagrams and whatever, the question is, wh wh what, why did I do this for? So uh, what we managed to do here, actually, we, we distilled the concept of a, of a tuple into a very, very small thing, this uh, tiny thing that is the indexing diagram. So once you write this down, this, if, you, if you take the, the view of using limits and cones and stuff, this fully describes for a mathematician what a tuple is. And so, so, so now you have a kind of a new new algorithm of exploring the idea space. Draw a picture, get a concept. So, and you can do exactly that. So here are some pictures. Each one of those can, you can convert to the to the scheme before. So you have so this is an indexing category. You choose some objects. You do a universal thing with the cones limits, and this is, whole thing is is a concept. So we found a very minimal way to describe various concepts without repeating anything other than the exact structure that we care about. So here, structure was. Two, two things in some way. Uh, and also notice that because of duality, we have actually two concepts for each one. So each one of those is our two concepts in a very, very minimal, uh, minimal way. So this is, is, is a very nice way to explore 
to, to idea and uh, explore the idea space. And I find this kind of minimization of a concept very, very pleasing as a programmer because it kind of reused everything and just distilled like the one single thing that actually actually is different. Now I won't be going into these diagrams. Uh, but we'll look at this one diagram, which, which seems kind of boring, but it'll be useful for, uh, for later on. <coughs> so let's, let's try to, to explore this diagram. So the empty diagram over like nothing. Okay? So we start by drawing a cone over the empty diagram. So a cone over the empty diagram is just some object. No arrows, no nothing. So that's quite simple. Uh, and we want to say that this one is the best cone ever uh, in our category. So we, we draw another cone. So this is another cone over the empty diagram. So there's pretty much nothing here. But we want to say that this one is the best. So if this one is the best, there is a universal, uh, universal arrow pointing into this, into this uh, object. So uh, if you read this correctly, this means that for any object in our category, there's exactly one arrow to go into this one object. And we call this object the terminal object and mark it, mark it with one. Uh, so, so the terminal object is special. It's kind of an endpoint of, of the category where kind of everything boils down to this one special object w which we can map into. And there's, of course, the dual object called the initial object, which is marked with zero. It has the dual property of you can always map from it. You have a single way to map from it to any other object in the category. And more concretely, in the category of types, uh, the terminal object is, is usually denoted as unit. <coughs> uh, and the initial object uh, should be the type unit, not the value unit. Uh, uh, and the initial object is, is the nothing type, the uninhabited type that has no values. Uh, and it may, might seem, again, an abstract way of describing something, but uh, terminal uh, and initial objects are a very good starting place. Like if you have a new category and you want to explore it, the terminal and the initial objects are very good places to start exploring the structure of the new category, which is exactly what we're going to do uh, next. <coughs> okay, so far we, we, we've been looking at the category of types. Uh, what we, uh, which is kind of the natural category for programmers to live in. But uh, we're not limited to talking only about strictly about types. We can do something more, uh, mo uh, more uh, varied and, and kind of interesting. So what, what I want to show next is how the, the structure of a category can appear kind of out of nowhere in, in other things and how we can explore and, and get insights from this structure. So we'll start with something that's, that's very common in programming, so monoids. Uh, so I, mo monoids are the kind of the essence of combining two things together. And this is one way to define a monoid in Scala. This is Scala 3, so kind of nicer syntax, m much more slide friendly uh, than before. <coughs> So, so this, if, you, if, if you're familiar with monoids, you might notice that this is not the standard way of defining them. It kind of has weird signatures, uh, but it'll be more con uh, convenient for the translation we're about, uh, about to make here. So what I want to do is take the monoid that we know and love from programming and convert it into the categorical equivalent uh, using diagrams, objects, and whatnot. So, so a monoid over some, some type A is going to be is going to have uh, a, a, a combined operation. So given a product of two A's, we can combine them into a single one. So this is the combined function we have here. It will also have uh, 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 the empty morphism that says that starting from the uh, in, uh, terminal objects, we, we, we have a function that takes us into A. Now this is a bit of cheating because I said that uh, objects don't care about structure and there shouldn't be a way in category theory to kind of point into specific elements of, uh, of an object. But this, this way is kind of a cheating way of, of doing that. So we we're just starting from the unit and, and like functions from unit are exactly constants within a specific type. So that's, that's the way mathematicians cheat and uh, and do stuff. Uh, so, so th this is actually so. So, so th this is uh, uh, a full categorical description of a monoid. So we we're not talking about specific structures or anything. We're just showing a diagram of how things should be relating. Uh, obviously, there are some monoid laws which we, I, I won't uh, go into too deeply now. So. <coughs> uh, so, so now that we have something that describes a monoid, I, I want to do something more interesting with it. I want to build a category of monoids. Okay, so what do I mean by this? So uh, uh, imagine that, that we, 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 have, so we have a new category where objects are going to be monoids. So uh, a monoid over A, is, for example, a monoid of ints and strings and the like. So each object is going to be uh, a type plus the operations that make it a, mon a monoid. Uh, and the question is, what in such a category, what will be the morphisms? So <coughs> So suppose we have two monoids, A and B. Uh, we're going to say that, that uh, a morphism uh, uh, between the two is called a homomorphism. It's something that preserves the structure of being a monoid. So wh what do I mean 
uh, or respects the structure of being a monoid. So what do I mean specifically? It means that, that uh, we can start with the unit and move, uh, move into the empty object of, of, uh, of A, and then if we take H down here, we get the same empty object, you get the, the empty uh, uh, value from B. Okay, so we're preserving the emptiness property of, of our monoid. It also must res uh, respect the combination function. So, so here we have a commutative diagram that says that it doesn't matter wh whether we first take two A's, combine them, and then uh, do uh, go, go over H with the homomorphism to B, or we first apply H on, on both elements of A, then, then combine using B. So it doesn't matter whether we first combine and then move, or move and then combine. Uh, and <coughs> uh, so any function, function that makes this diagram commute, that, that you can go through it in, 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 a, in a way that it doesn't matter which path you choose, uh, will, be, uh, will be homomorphism. And uh, it does happen that homomorphisms compose. So you have, you have two such fun uh, functions that, that preserve the, these properties. If you have two of them, you can compose them to a, one bigger one that, that does the, the thing for you. And every time you see composition, you should look for a category. That was the quote at the beginning, uh, at the beginning of the section. And so, uh, behold, this is the, the the category of monoids. It's a lovely category. So we have monoids as objects, homomorphisms as as our morphisms, and that's a very nice category to have. And we can just look at it and admire it, uh, or not. Uh, <coughs> So can we learn anything new from this category? So it's obviously related to the other category we started with. So types, uh, so the, the types we have here are exactly the same types we had before. But the morphisms are special. So we do not take any other, any other morphism uh, uh, from the original category, just the ones that preserve the properties that we like, the homomorphisms. So, uh, so th there is a relationship between the original category of types and the category of monoids that we just got here. And because category theory is so well equipped for uh, analyzing relationships, this one is worth looking into. Uh, and specifically, this re relationship is about forgetting. So if we forget the monoid structure, we get back our original category. So, uh, the, um, <coughs> So, so before, we were, when we were talking about duality, there was another relationship. We could kind of re reverse the arrows and get something, for, uh, one thing from another. The question is, can we can we reverse forgetting? And the answer is no. Usually, we can, you can't just unforget yourself into something because when you forget structure, you you lose something. So, for example, if we had the monoid over int uh, with addition, then if you if you forget it, you get just int. You don't know which monoid to go back into. So you can't unforget yourself back into a monoid. And even more more problematic is that homomorphisms are quite rare. Not every function is going to be a homomorphism. Uh, so uh, so. How how can so if I want to kind of invent an unforgetting process, how can I how can I uh, do that? So we can actually do that. So let's uh, focus on specific specific functions. So imagine that you have some object A and a function, a regular function, into D, which is a monoid. So it's not likely to be a homomorphism, okay? Because most functions are not homomorphisms, but maybe uh, it can be decomposed into one. So imagine that you you have another way to go into D that goes through some other function and a homomorphism between C and D. So this we can think as the homomorphic part of F, and we kind of decompose F into two parts, which one of which is homomorphic. This kind of gets us closer to, to the, the thing we started with the original diagram. But obviously, uh, doing this is probably not unique because you have different ways of doing the same decomposition. So for example, I could go from A to B and then to D, and that would be another way to decompose. So it's not unique, but <coughs> Uh, but what we do, like a suggestive way that I draw this diagram shows that we have some sort of composition. So the, the idea of decomposing kind of composes itself. So for example, I, I can take two decompositions and turn them in, into one. So again, we have composition, and since we have composition, this is our cue to search for a category. And we do have a category here, a rather weird one. Uh, and so uh, the objects in our new category are going to be functions from A. Okay, so not the objects, the functions from A are going uh, into some monoids are going to be our, our objects, weirdly, and the homomorphisms are going to be uh, the, the homomorphisms that decompose them between uh, between different monoids. Um, so, so the idea is that this category, which we kind of built up from the idea of unforgetting, for kind of getting back into a monoid once we lost one, it should be embody, embody the notion of unforgetting into a category. So it looks very weird, abstract, probably useless in most cases, but uh, first of all, this is called a comma category for some obscure mathematical reason, which is ju just like a historical uh, quirk. But let's let's explore this new category. Can we learn something new about unforgetting just from writing the category? So before we wrote, we wrote something categorically and learned something new about tuples. So can we learn something here? So. <coughs> 
So uh, as I mentioned before in the previous section, a good way to start exploring a new category, and we have a new category here, the, the comma category, is to look at the initial and terminal objects. So let's take a look at the initial object. So initial object, uh, so we said that the objects in our, in, in our category are functions from A into monoids. So, so this is kind of some monoid, this is a function. So this is an object in our, uh, in our category, and so it should be initial. So if it's initial, it means that, that for any other object uh, any other object uh, uh, in this category, there's a unique morphism pointing from our initial initial object here into that other object. So this should look like looks like this. So this is uh, a diagram which has a universal error, which is a homomorphism. So it's kind of mixing up two different categories: the one with monoids, the one with types. And you have a new diagram here. So so notice how we took two different concepts. So one of initiality, one of this new category of, of uh, comma category, the unforgetting kind of ca category. Uh, and we got something new, complete. So there's like a new diagram we can now explore. Is this, is this a useful concept? Do we know anything about it? And uh, so the nice thing is that we just kind of, this kind of popped out of, out, out of our exploration. But the not so nice thing is that you have to figure out on your own whether it's useful or not. So we have, have some arbitrary diagram. You have to kind of figure out whether you can use it for something or not. So that's what we'll try to do next. So, uh, so we're trying to guess what, what is this initial object that we're looking at? What is this diagram describing here? So for concreteness, I'm going to use specific types. So we're going to start from unit and go into integers. Uh, and we're trying to figure out what is this, this initial unit kind of thing is, is actually describing. So, <coughs> so first of all, uh, so we'll choose a specific app. So f from unit is going to be 5. And we know uh, a few things. For, for example, we know that, uh, that uh, using the inj function, I call, inject, uh, I call this function inject because it injects into our initial monoid. So using in the injection function on unit is, is the same as, uh, as, as, as going to f here. So f uh, here is 5. Uh, so it's the same as doing the inject function and then using the, the h uh, function that we don't yet know here. So this is one equation which is we got about about our uh, about our new construction. Also, we know because this is a homomorphism. So the uh, so if you're looking at the monoid of, of integers uh, with addition, so zero is the empty element. So h of empty should be zero because we need to pr preserve the monoid structure. Uh, we also know that uh, we, we're supposed to preserve the uh, uh, the combination function. So five plus five, which is by this equation, is like this, these two terms. We can pull out the h uh, uh, on the on the outside and say that it's the same as first combining the the two elements in our mystery monoid with this mystery operation that we don't yet know, and then applying h. And we can do this uh, multiple times, uh, pretty much as many times as we want, to kind of generate unique elements within our monoids. And since the left side is unique, so is the right side as well. And so we're generating arbitrary elements within the monoid that we don't really uh, know about yet. And so the question is, what is this thing? So, so, so this is, these are the elements that we have within, within our monoid. So, so what, what does this describe? So it's, it's kind of obscured by bad naming. But if I do a quick rename, so the empty element is pretty much uh, nil. And we had a delimited list of, of, of h inject, and, and so a delimited list of inject op uh, ing. Uh, and so it's, it's the same as creating an empty list with unit and concatenating them. So what we got here is the, uh, is the list, uh, arbitrary uh, length lists of unit, okay? Just from kind of applying the, this weird unforgetting relationship. And uh, uh, so, the inject, uh, so the inject function that we had before is wrapping unit into a list. Uh, and in general, uh, we can say that that the initial object over some A is a list of A. Uh, inject builds a singleton list, takes a single element and wraps it into a list. Uh, and uh, the, the H here, the homomorphism that we, we tried to figure out here before, is the, the fold map function that, uh, that exists in various Scala, Scala libraries and in the Haskell, uh, Haskell uh, standard library as well. Uh, and so what is interesting about this thing is that we created kind of, we, we took some random object and made it into a monoid, uh, which is called the free monoid. Uh, in this case, so A became a list of A in, in a way that has no junk and no noise. What does it mean? It means that we don't have any elements besides the elements that must be uh, in this monoid to be, uh, to be a monoid. We don't have any extra elements. And we also don't have, uh, 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 nothing is missing. So, so, we, so th th there isn't anything, so there's nothing extra and nothing, uh, uh, and nothing missing. So we have the kind of the, the best fit way to, to create a monoid from an arbitrary object. So we, man, although we can't unforget things precisely, but we can take forget something as a monoid and then unforget it back into a free monoid, which is, will be the minimal way of, um, the minimal way of, of creating a monoid from an arbitrary object. Um, so, so, <coughs> 
So basically, we managed to find a, uh, uh, find a new concept, in this case, free monoid, out of some arbitrary uh, diagram that we've drawn using like, random mechanical tools in category theory. So uh, circling back to the quote from the, from the beginning of this part, so uh, whenever you see composition of some way, so any kind of composition, there's probably some kind of category lurking around. And by learning, kind of exposing this categorical structure, you might be able to discover something new. Like for example, by exposing the, the, the forgetfulness of this monoid category, uh, we learn something new about free monoids, for example. So hopefully this, this uh, exploration kind of illustrates the, the point. Okay, so this is the, the last section, hopefully the most relevant to our daily programming kind of stuff. No, pre last section, actually. Uh, okay, so, so far we've been exploring concepts within specific category. category and now we, what I want to do now is kind of take uh, uh, some concept, generalize it, and make it portable between ca categories. So this, this way we could kind of explore an idea in one place and then move it around in other pla to other places and see what it exposes for us. Um, and this will ser seriously kind of uh, uh, improve our abilities to explore the idea space. So l let's get back again to the definition of a monoid. So looking at this thing, it's, it's kind of hard-coded for the category of types. So, so we have a specific mention of the product type, which is, uh, which is something specific to some categories, but not all categories has product, have products. And we have unit here, which is, again, a specific thing that exists uh, in the category of types, but doesn't necessarily exist in any other categories. And this definition is not portable. So if I had a category, category without products and without units, I'm, I won't be able to use monoids there. And as programmers like portable code, mathematicians like portable definitions so they can use them in many other places and not uh, and not have to rewrite uh, everything from scratch uh, so let's try to make this portable so so the first thing to do is uh, as we're replacing the product type with something called the tensor uh, product so if, if you remember our, our work with the monoids we never actually use the fact that the product is is the product that it has two elements of type a and that we can extract it from them we just use something that have like some concept of two-ness of A's, but not, not specifically the product type. So we're going to replace it with pretty much any well-behaved function of two A's. The, um, we don't really care what function that is. Uh, next, we're going to uh, um, look, at, look at unit. So uh, I previously said that unit is used kind of a way to cheat uh, uh, into pointing at specific elements of A, but there's another purpose of A, uh, of unit, and that's it's the neutral element for our product type. So if we take A uh, product unit, it's the same thing as A. So what I want here is something that is the n uh, neutral element for the tensor, uh, tensor product. So we're going to call it I as uh, the identity. Uh, so something that, uh, that given uh, one, one tensor with A is still kind of the same as A. And so, so we can replace, uh, replace our, uh, our, our unit into this thing. And now we have a completely general definition of a monoid. So this is not tied to any specific category. We can, we, we can move it around between categories. Any category where, where we have some tensor and some identity for the tensor can, can form a, this generalized monoid. And so, so now we can take this definition and try to see whether we can apply it in something, something else, something more, more interesting. So for this purpose, I'm going to introduce a kind of a radically new category, something that's completely different than, than the category of like regular types or monoids or whatever. And it's the category of endofunctors. So our, our objects are going to be uh, what mathematicians call endofunctors and what confusingly programmers call regular functors. So, uh, so an object in our new category is going to be a functor, something, uh, a functor of f, or sorry, a functor of g. Um, so basically our objects are not types but type constructors and morphisms are going to be natural transformations. So uh, I, I won't delve more deeply into what a natural transformation is, but for programmers it's basically any function that takes a type parameter is a natural transformation. Uh, so something that can uniformly take us from f, uh, f of a to, uh, to g of a, no matter what a is, is a natural transformation. So, for example, if, if we want to take examples, so, so here to, to natural transformation, so option to list something that takes any option and turns it in, into a list. Doesn't, and it doesn't care about the specific types uh, inside it. And of course, both option and list uh, have, have functor instances, so this all works out. Uh, so for us to have a monoid, we need to have some tensor product. So we're going to define this uh, uh, new tensor product. So we're going to use functor composition. So f tensor g of a is going to be f of g of a. Notice how it's completely, uh, completely unrelated to in any way to, uh, uh, to the product uh, we saw before, because composition is not a regular product in, in any sense. 
And we also have the identity uh, the identity element for our tensor, so the identity functor, so which takes a back to a is the identity of this tensor. And with this in place, we can we can start to generalize, uh, look at our generalized monoid. So so we start by replacing uh, uh, replacing our uh, elements with functors. So so we have uh, f's instead of of a's. Uh, we then replace the identity with the actual identity functor f uh, that we defined before. And since it's kind of bothersome to talk about uh, functors generically, I'm going to quantify the diagram with A. So this thing is, should be read as, for any A you choose, I can write this diagram. This way I can reference A without spoiling kind of the effect of using uh, this category. So, uh, so we can now apply A to the identity functor. So identity of A is just A, so we can replace A here. And we can uh, add A here, so F of A. And we can change the, uh, uh, the tensor thing, uh, tensor product with f of f of a. Okay, so what do we have? So this is a diagram that describes something, and the question is, what is this something? So we got here rather mechanically. We started out with monoids, we generalized, and then moved to a weird category, and we have a new thing. So what is this new thing? So the new thing, uh, so I'll be brief because I don't actually have time. So, so uh, if, if, we, if, if we go uh, to the original monoid, uh, generalized, we can replace all the components. So, so we can put a func uh, functor instead of A's. So we have uh, F of F and uh, F of stuff. And then we can use the specific tensor product, which is fun functor composition. So F of F of A into F of A. And then we can rename, and we just got ourselves a monad. So, uh, so before we had a monoid, and it was in the category of types, but now we have a monad in a category of vendor functors, which gives rise to the uh, to the now infamous quote that a monad is just a monad in the category of vendor functors. So this was a very quick explanation of of this quote, and you can even define the regular flat map that we're familiar with using those uh, those things. So so we actually moved between categories into uh, where where a monad is actually a monad, which extra confusing for people who actually keep confusing monads and monoids anyway, so it is actually a monoid. Okay. Um, <coughs> sorry. Okay, so, uh, so, so moving to the categories is a kind of a, a way to reuse knowledge kind of, of uh, an overdrive because, because uh, w w once, you, once you manage to, to do this, this kind of uh, transformation, you get things for free. For example, you can reuse concepts from monoids into the world of monads. So, for example, free monoids are, uh, are now translated into free monads. And if you, if you were thinking about the dual of monads, which, is, uh, which you can think about in regular types, uh, then you have commonoids become commonads. So, so basically, yeah, uh, uh, and also, also you can reuse uh, various laws. So monoids are usually, usually equipped with laws, and you can reuse them in the in the new definition. So you get all of this for free in a way that it's very very difficult uh, difficult to kind of derive on your own if you if you were just looking at those two things separately. So imagine achieving this level level of reuse with just regular code and without category category theory. And hopefully one day maybe we'll be able to write nice categorical code as well. Now that really last part, and I'll hopefully manage in like two minutes. Uh, so this is the, the case study, um, <coughs> which I promised. And the light, because there is no case study. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't actually show you the club. OK, so, so there isn't an actual case study, because there isn't a case. So it's basically a study rather than a case. Uh, <coughs> So, so imagine you're writing some some function uh, that takes uh, takes a list and does something with it and returns a monoid. And you can kind of spell out tediously recursion and going over the list and aggregating elements and stuff. And then you remember that you heard the talk recently that says that a uh, list is the free monoid. So we can you can use fold map that we just learned about and and, and take take a, a function from A to monoids and the list and it will magically do everything you uh, as you wanted it to do. Uh, so, so this is the initiality that we used before, and now uh, we can go go ahead and, for example, generalize it. So, if if we generalize it into the the other category, the category of end functors, uh, suddenly we have a new function called fold free. And I just mechanically replace the definitions with just like I did in the previous section. And now we have a new function, which is actually a very useful function if if you're working with free monads and actually exists in libraries. And you can, uh, and so you got this for free just from. Uh, from uh, generalization, and um, because we learned about duality, you can look at this as well. So we flipped all, all the arrows, and we get some new function with new types and new things called un unfold co free, which is uh, rather esoteric, but also kind of useful if you're using very abstract code that does have co free components. And so l look at the three type signatures here, and kind of imagine kind of the huge journey we made through kind of the idea space, moving between various concepts, and, and kind of and, and kind of mechanically translating from one place to another, and getting completely different things. And imagine kind of trying to figure this out on your own without the powerful tools of of, uh, of category theory that we just kind of explores. 
Uh, and to, to, to summarize, uh, we can take a step back uh, and, and take a look at what, 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 we, what we did in this talk. So, so we talked about three concepts, uh, duality, initiality, and generalization. And we started with two very simple concepts. And we kind of tried to move it around. So, so we used duality to derive the sum, and we used uh, initiality for free monoids and generalization for, for monoids. And this, this was just the beginning, because you can do so many more things. So we did limits as well, and free monoids and commonons, and you can just walk around and, 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 and kind of See, see many, many new things, but but these three techniques are just scratching the surface, scratching the surface, because you have other techniques that we didn't talk about that are just as interesting and, uh, for exploration. So, for example, you have the Uneda lemma and the junctions and con extensions, which I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. And you can just kind of move around and mix and match everything. Everything is reusable. So, unlike like usual code, you you have this reusability of concepts, which you can just move around and and derive new new interesting and exciting things. Uh, and I, th I, I think it's, it's kind of amazing because uh, although it's not easy to grasp and takes time to learn and explore, but but the idea that I can walk around all this this richness and kind of find it out with with the tools of category theory, I, I personally find it amazing. Um, sorry. So so. Imagine having all these tools at your disposal, so learning about category theory more deeply than I showed here, obviously, because that, that was just scratching the surface. And imagine what, what sort of things you'll be able to discover. So this is, this is, these are known things. Can you kind of find something new and more exciting? And uh, since this is all I have for you today, I'll leave you with this weird, ponderous quote. And, and this, uh, hopefully one day I'll figure out what it means, but that's not today. And this is the presentation, uh, fully available here. And I, I guess I don't have time for questions for you, so you can reach, <laughs> reach out at the hall and ask me uh, later. So thank you very much. Um, <clears throat>